All right, so good morning. And today we're gonna to talk about how to fertilize plants. And this is a class geared for homeowners, like people who just have normal yards. Um, you know, the, the principles are pretty much applicable all around the world, but you know, this class is more specifically geared for a Florida garden in, you know, we're right here in Tampa and Hillsborough County. So my name is Tia Solvesi and I'm the extension agent with UF IFIS Extension, Hillsborough County. And we also have Sarah Uswick and she's with the Hillsborough County Environmental management division because as you will see you know what we are applying in the fertilizer in our own yards has an effect on the environment so um, we'll get to that part too so let's get started here and um I'm not gonna play this, but there's a really great video by extension agent down in Lee County, Stephen Brown. And you can find this video by just Googling, do plants need fertilizers? Um, he makes an excellent case about, you can see how he's walking in the natural forest. And so do plants need fertilizers? And the answer is no. I mean, mother nature before fertilizers were even invented, you know, all the different trees and ferns and the squirrels that run around and, you know, it's a, it's a living ecosystem and you're having a diversity of uh, materials like biomass, like plant matter that are growing because plants are really amazing in the fact that they have the ability to photosynthesize. And so with their leaves, they're just hanging out, catching the sunlight and they're producing sugars, which can make carbohydrates. So just by the plant leaves, they're making their own food. They're called autotrophs. Whereas we as humans, we have to eat plants and animals and nuts and berries to you know, nourish our bodies. And so if you're in a natural forest, no, they don't need fertilizer because it takes care of itself. It's a self-sustaining system. You know, it's a closed loop system. The leaves fall from the trees and they go to the ground and they decompose and release the nutrients and get sucked up by the trees and the bushes and everything. Um, but when we are more in a urban landscape situation, we don't have like that diversity of materials. In another scene in his YouTube video, there's like a little easement that's in between a road and a sidewalk. And it has just one type of plant in it, like a pittosporum bush. And it just has one type of mulch, like this kind of hardwood, you know, chunky mulch. And so in that situation, the plants may need fertilizer because they're, it's not like a living ecosystem with all that biodiversity of nutrients. And so this is the ultimate goal to create in your home landscape is to have your own little ecological landscape where you have a diversity of plants and you're letting some of the organic matter, you know, fall to the ground. Like when you mow the grass, there's a saying, mow and grow, no, mow and go mow and go, you leave the grass clippings on the lawn. Um, when the trees lose their leaves, we have the saying, leaf it be. And so you just leave the leaves, you can mow them in, you can rake them into your landscape beds. But you know, those are all the macronutrients, micronutrients, carbon that's feeding the microbes and creating that more holistic um, ecosystem. Um, so also if you're growing food crops like uh, vegetables and fruits, like if you ever saw what corn looked like back in the day when it was teosinte back in Mexico, it was just a small little baby grain, like not much edible stuff to it. But over the years, as we've selected for bigger, fatter grains and then pumped it up with a bunch of fertilizer, now for the 4th of July, we have these humongous delicious, you know, sweet, juicy corn ears. So um, if you wouldn't apply fertilizer, like this, this spring, I had a little um, broccoli plant in the back. I didn't apply any fertilizer. The broccoli had still produced, but it was like the size of a baseball. 
but the one that I grew at home and I gave it like lots of good loving with fertilizer and stuff, it produced a broccoli head this big. So it can help increase yields of our fruits and vegetables. So before we're talking about fertilizer, it's important that we know the basics of soil science because you know fertilizer is kind of just like a Band-Aid on the bigger problem, which is the soil. In Florida soil, we have um, very sandy soil and just some characteristics of sandy soil because we used to be underwater or a beach, you know, um, it has very good drainage. So the water goes down and it has low nutrient and water holding capacity. So the nutrients are easily lost. Um, the water doesn't stick around. And that's uh, kind of the cation exchange capacity, or you'll hear people talk about CEC. That's just a fancy name for the soil's ability to hold on to the cations like calcium and nitrate and um, you know things that are gonna stick to the soil. And because we have a low CEC, we have a high risk of leaching. So the soil can't hold on to the nutrients. And when you put the nitrogen down, it just kind of poof, goes down into the soil, maybe through leaching. And so that's why we want to you know, fundamentally add compost to improve the soil. So even if you use no fertilizer and you only use compost, you can grow some beautiful plants in your yard. Um, it's good enough to grow a nice healthy head of lettuce and other leafy greens, really good. And so, you know, the picture before here was this, you know, sandy soil. So then you add compost and then you get this nice, rich, you know, darker, loamy soil and it increases the soil moisture holding capacity. So it holds that water and then also holds the nutrients because it has a higher charge and then all the, all the nutrients wanna to stick to it. And so um, without going too deep into soil science, you know, the compost is just a really amazing kind of super remedy for, for your garden. Um, it also adds life to your soil. And so unless you have a, a degree in microbiology or whatever, you might see the earthworms and the, the little pill bugs and stuff crawling through your soil. But there's also bacteria and fungi. And a lot of these are beneficial and they're helping to decompose the organic matter and then eat it and poop it out and release that back into the environment in plant available forms. And then they also have added benefits, you know, just like in our bodies, we take probiotics and it helps with our immune system and fighting off disease. So it has added benefits in that respect too. So a lot of people get confused about like compost versus fertilizer and compost is like organic matter. You can see, you know, the little compost bin there and it's not really considered fertilizer because by law, fertilizer has to have a guaranteed analysis. So they send it to a lab and it has to say at least, you know, like in this example here, 16% nitrogen. So, you know, they have to test it every batch before they send it out for the commercial market. Whereas compost, they don't test it for nitrogen. It's just broken down organic matter. And it generally does not have kind of like an NPK analysis on it. So compost is just generally good to add to all plants at all times, especially in Florida. You know, you probably want to add compost several times a year or every time you plant a new plant or every time you put in your new vegetable garden. And it, it helps to build soil health and many other things. Whereas fertilizer, you know, has the guaranteed analysis. Um, that is required by law, it may or may not contain organic matter. Like in the back here, we have some examples of different fertilizers and the organic ones you can see are more brown looking and kind of smell like fish poop or something a little bit. Whereas the synthetic fertilizers, they contain nothing organic. And so it can be either way. And they add nutrients and each fertilizer blend has something different. And um, if you're using fertilizer, then you're subject to the fertilizer ordinance, which are very popular in Florida. 
Um, we have around 115 ordinances in the whole state, even though there's only 67 counties. So there's, you know, like here we have the city of Tampa ordinance and then we have the Hillsborough County ordinance. So you really have to determine what municipality that you're in. So I was talking a little bit about the microbes. So uh, microbes are very important with like adding compost and creating that, you know, beneficial ecosystem. You know, here's the soil food web um, and you're starting with, you know, plants that make organic matter and then the bacteria and the fungi, those are microscopic organisms and they eat it. And then the next thing, the, the nematodes, the arthropods, the protozoa, they eat those. And then, you know, then comes birds and raccoons and people, you know, eating the next things up on the chain. So these are just very important. And it's actually a measure of soil health is the biodiversity of these microbes you have and um, like we have a workshop tomorrow where we're having a nematologist and stuff. And so they'll actually look in the microscope at the soil samples and count, okay, well, there's this number of this type, there's this number of this type, and that will give you a actual measure of the soil health. So if you really want to dork out, you can go buy a microscope and take your own soil samples and look at it. It's really fun and cool. There's um, a lady, Elaine Ingram, and she is like a really soil scientist lady, I think in California or something, but she actually has videos on amateur using microscopes to look for these beneficial soil organisms. So that's cool to check out on, she's on YouTube and stuff. Um, so another thing we need to know about the soil is the pH. So is our soil acidic? which means low pH, or is it alkaline, which means high pH, or is it somewhere in the neutral area? So we do soil pH testing here at our office. Um, and if we get a sample that tests between say 5.5 and 7.5, we're gonna kind of call that in the good range and just for general plants. And we're gonna be like, your pH is good. You know, there's nothing you need to do. It's in the good range. If you bring in a sample and it's 8.3, we're gonna say your pH is a little bit high. Or if it's 4.5, like unless you're growing blueberries, then your pH is a little bit low. If you just wanna um, do normal plants. So if you have a low pH and your pH, you wanna raise it, then what do you do? You add some lime. But be careful, don't add too much, because if you get uh, too high of a pH, that's very difficult to bring down. So we can use sulfur, we can use acidifying fertilizers like that have ammonia in them. Um, but compost, remember the super star compost actually has an amazing ability to neutralize the pH. So whether it's too high or too low, the compost will help to bring it back towards the middle. We call that buffering the pH. And so again, always add compost. And so if you want to do your um, soil testing, here's how you go about doing it. Um, first of all, you want to give us a couple weeks, like maybe three weeks or a month, you know, before you're starting your major garden project, like maybe you're going to spend $3,000 and resod your front lawn. Has anybody done that before? You know? You might want to spend that $3 and get the pH test to see if maybe you need to modify or maybe you'll be all good. Um, so when we get the sample, we get one cup of soil. But in your yard, say you're doing your front yard, you want to take like 12 subsamples. You want to dig it down like six inches deep and then mix them all together in a clean bucket and then just give us the one cup of the mix of the subsamples. And so if you're doing your lawn area, you might wanna just submit one, we call it a composite sample for the lawn. If you're doing a vegetable garden, maybe do one composite sample of your vegetable garden. If you have a lawn that is just doing really horrible and you're trying to find out what is wrong, then you might wanna do two samples, one of the healthy part 
and another composite sample of the sick part. And then we can compare. Okay, they both had the same pH. Well, pH isn't a problem. But oh, this is in the good range here. It's 6.5. And over here, it's 8.3. Well, we can do something about that. Um, you can bring them to our office in a Ziploc bag. And we only test um, pH at our lab here. If you want the full nutrient analysis, like phosphorus, potassium, iron, like micronutrients, then you can send like in the mail to the lab in Gainesville. Um, for like landscape and lawns, you choose soil test B and the cost for that is $12 and you have to pay the shipping yourself. Um, we have a new option, which is the soil kit, the third one on the list here. And that one already includes shipping, but it's $30. And so you can um, pick up uh, one of these packs here in our front office, and then you go <laughs> online by scanning the QR code and like register. And then um, it gives you all the instructions on how to get that submitted. So after you do the soil test, then you get the results and you're looking at this sheet of paper. And so how do you decipher these results? And, um, you know, this is what our master gardener volunteers get trained to do. You know, anybody who has a degree in soil science should be able to do this, but it's a little bit tough for normal homeowner people to um, look at this and read it. But the first thing you want to look at is the pH. Is the pH in that good range, 5.5 to 7.5? If it is, then good, check that box. Um, the next thing, well, first of all, this does not tell you the nitrogen in the soil. Nitrogen is very uh, volatile, so it, we can lose it by leaching. It can go poof in the air through volatilization. And unless you ship your sample overnight in a refrigerated cooler, the nitrogen is gonna go poof. So we don't really measure nitrogen at the lab. We just assume all soils have no nitrogen, which is not exactly true, but for, you know, testing purposes. Um, phosphorus now is usually going to read high. Can you see on the, um, the little here, it says medium high for phosphorus. And Florida, because of our um, soil type and mineralogy, we are very high in phosphorus. So most Florida soils have tons of phosphorus. We don't need to add any more. We actually have phosphorus mines here. Um, now, potassium is usually going to be low, so that's a key thing to look at. Look at the potassium. Mm -hmm. And like this soil test here, yeah, the potassium is between very low and low. And then um, it also shows a measurement of magnesium, and it has a number here for calcium. Um, calcium is typically adequate in Florida soils. Um, but, you know, it's a good thing to keep a measure on. And then it will tell you the micronutrients and stuff later. So um, you have to look at those individually. Um, most soil tests don't tell you the soil biology, like how many beneficial microbes are in the soil. So that's something you can feel out for yourself or look in the microscope or send it to a different lab. And then it, some of them tell you some of the micronutrients or trace elements and not other ones. So um, we have a blog about this soil testing you guys can check out. So here are the um, plant nutrients. So some of um, like plant nutrients, they, the scientists kind of debate like 15 essential nutrients, maybe 17 essential nutrients like chlorine, like do they really need that? Um, but from the environment, we get carbon, we get hydrogen and we get oxygen. Those are free. Think about water, H2O. So we get hydrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, there's carbon in the soil. Um, so those are just naturally coming from the environment. The plant can absorb those from the environment. Um, and the other ones, the plant can get from the environment, but sometimes we supplement them with fertilizer. So the primary macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, those numbers on the bag, the NPK, and then the secondary macronutrients, so macro is like needed in large quantities, calcium, magnesium, sulfur. 
And so um, these are all needed in large counties. Now I'm gonna talk about just these three real quick because these are very important. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Nitrogen is the number one like needed in the largest quantities. And that's why you'll see on the bags of fertilizer, the first number is the nitrogen. You know, it can be two, four, that would be kind of a weak fertilizer. The more higher the number is like 30%, 60%, you know, that's a lot of that bag that is nitrogen. And so it's needed the most by the plants. If you're deficient, it will kind of show a uniform yellowing on the lower leaves. Um, and, the yellow because nitrogen helps out with chlorophyll, which kind of drives photosynthesis and the greening. Also amino acids and like protein building. And so um, the other thing about nitrogen is it's, it comes in many different forms. Think about like nitrate or ammonium and it's um, subject to leaching and can harm the environment. So nitrate leaching, you put the fertilizer in the ground, a big heavy rain comes or a hurricane and it, we get seven inches of rain and poof, all that goes down, down, down into the groundwater, into the Tampa Bay, it makes the algae grow. Now phosphorus is rare to see a phosphorus deficiency in Florida because we're very high in phosphorus. I actually had to steal this photo from the Wikipedia Commons because um, you can see the purpling on the plant leaf there is a sign of phosphorus deficiency, but we don't get that a lot. Phosphorus, it helps with root formation and flowering. Um, generally like landscape plants and turf grass, there's enough in the environment for them. You might want to use phosphorus on specialty crops, like your annual flowers or vegetables, especially starting seeds of vegetables. Most vegetable food has some phosphorus in it, uh, abundant in most Florida soils. Um, and it's actually required by our fertilizer ordinance that you have a soil test showing low phosphorus in order to apply phosphorus on your lawn and your landscape. Now vegetables are exempt, so don't worry about those. Now phosphorus is not mobile in the soil. So we get a heavy rain, it doesn't necessarily just go poof, but it kind of attaches itself to the soil particles. And then when we get the heavy rain and it washes out all the sand in your yard down the drain, all that phosphorus is going along down with it. And so it's more kind of lost in erosion. So that's why we want to plant lots of plants to prevent erosion, like bare spots in your grass, plug them in, you know, steep slopes, plant cord grass or something to hold that soil. Even cypress trees and oak trees are great at preventing erosion. And so um, phosphorus and nitrogen, they both can harm the water bodies, you know, by increasing the algae growth in the red tide. So finally, we have potassium. So this is the third number in the bag, the NPK. Now potassium, there's a saying up for nitrogen, down for phosphorus and all around for potassium because it's kind of like the micronutrient, I mean the um, multivitamin. Potassium helps with all around plant health. It helps with um, disease resistant. It helps with extreme weather conditions like drought tolerance, freeze tolerance, even makes the cell wall stronger to stand up to more wind. And this is a nutrient that's often low in Florida soil. So we need to watch out for this one with our palm trees, um, with our fruit trees, um, even with our turf grass. You wanna make sure to choose a fertilizer with potassium. And um, this can show up as kind of yellowing in the lower leaves and especially the tips of the leaves will yellow and they'll even brown. So brown tips can be a sign of potassium deficiency, also spotting, spotting on the leaves. And now this is like nitrogen where it's mobile, both in the plant, it can move around in the plant and it can move around in the soil, but potassium is not a pollutant for water bodies. And that's why you can still apply potassium all year round. All right. So um, next we're going to briefly talk about the micronutrients. Um, we could spend a whole hour talking about all these and, and what they look like, but you can look at this little deficiency chart 
um, of the nutrients and you can see at the bottom, you know, the nitrogen affects the lower leaves because the, the young leaves can kind of steal the nitrogen. Um, other other um, nutrients are not mobile in the plant. And so like sulfur, you'll see that, you know, the leaves are light green at the more top of the plant. Um, iron, the classic is that the veins are green and the interveins are yellow. So um, all of these contribute to plant health. And there's that law of the minimum. You might've seen the barrel and the picture of the barrel where if you don't have enough of one, you know, like if you're a little deficient in boron, your cabbage isn't gonna grow properly. So you wanna make sure you have all of these. Um, so let's talk about the contents of the fertilizer bag. So we've been talking about nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, the NPK. And these are the three numbers of the bag. So like this bag is 14% nitrogen. So the number on the bag means the percent of that nutrient in the bag. So if we have, I like to think about it in terms of a hundred pound bag, how many pounds of nitrogen would that be? 14, yeah. And then if you only had a 50 pound bag, you would have seven, yeah. And then actually like the bag in the back is a 33 pound bag. So how much would that be? Uh, yeah, so it's just kind of worked back from then. Um, so NPK, and if you look at the little number, like phosphate is P2O5. So that is the true form if you're um, doing some, um, you know, you like using the elemental weights and stuff of these um, nutrients, you would need to know that. But for basic homeowner purposes, you don't really need to know that. Um, so nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And remember the middle number should usually be zero when we're talking about turf grass and landscapes and um, that the nitrogen and phosphorus contribute to the water pollution. So next I'm gonna invite up Sarah Uswick and she is gonna tell you more about the Hillsborough County Fertilizer Ordinance and about um, water protection. So she has a degree in environmental science. And let's give her a round of applause to welcome her. Morning, everybody. Yes, we're going to go ahead and talk about the fertilizer ordinances. Um, there is one for the city of Tampa, as well as one for Hillsborough County. Um, mainly I talk about the Hillsborough County one, but the city of Tampa one, they're virtually identical. Um, both of the ordinances um, put a ban on fertilizer containing nitrogen and or phosphorus um, from the months of June 1st through September 30th. Um, and it's those months typically because that is our rainy season here in Central Florida and on the coast. Um, a lot of times when we get a lot of rain, sometimes fertilizer isn't applied appropriately or in bigger quantities than it should be. When you get a lot of rain, the rain's gonna pick up that fertilizer, the excess fertilizer, send it into our storm drains. They're gonna go to our stormwater ponds and eventually out to the bay. Um, and then in the time of the year, so when you're not in the fertilizer ban, when you're applying fertilizer containing nitrogen, it has to contain no less than 50% slow releasing nitrogen. Um, and in a few slides, we'll kind of go over how you get to that number. Um, it just means that you have to use fertilizer that is released at a slower rate. That way when you apply it, it kind of releases over a longer period of time. Um, and then as kind of she mentioned, any fertilizer containing phosphorus, you have to get a soil test analysis done on your soil um, to show deficiency before you can apply fertilizer or phosphorus to your lawn. Yeah, so the slow release nitrogen. So slow release nitrogen is coated either with, um, they have sulfur coated, sulfur polymer coated or resin coated. Um, you can look for these numbers. So on each fertilizer bag, you'll have the analysis on it. Um, sometimes it'll tell you exactly what the slow release nitrogen percentage is. Sometimes they make us do a little math. Um, but first thing you'll look for 
is at the very top or somewhere on it, it'll show you the total percentage of nitrogen. You can also get that number from that, that NPK number on the front of the bag typically. And then you'll look for where it says slowly available urea nitrogen. So in this case, it has 8% slow release nitrogen and 16% total nitrogen. You just put the slow release over the total. So in this case, eight over 16. So this bag contains 50% slow release nitrogen. Um, and I guess a good way to think about it, a lot of times like Skittles, M&M, any candy that's like, or chocolate that's candy coated, if you were to plant it, it wouldn't release as fast because you'd have to kind of get through the coating before you can actually get to the, the good stuff. <laughs> Um, this probably won't apply as much to homeowners, um, but if you do have a company coming in to, you know, do work on your lawn or apply fertilizer to your lawn, any commercial landscaper in Hillsborough County must have a fertilizer license, which they'll achieve after they complete the green industry's best management practices training. Um, once they have that training and their license, they'll actually submit a copy of that to EPC, the Environmental, Environmental Protection Commission, um, and they will have to show a decal on their vehicle to prove that they've passed those um, tests and that they have that license. Um, so you want to make sure if you ever get anybody to come out to your yard to do that kind of work, you want to make sure they have that license. Um, they are certified through EPC. So a lot of questions people have is during the ban, um, what can I apply to my lawn? So we have a lot of times we call like summer blends. These are going to be fertilizer blends that have some of those um, different nutrients and micronutrients such as iron, manganese, um, and they can be applied at any time of year as well as during the ban. We also talked about the compost. Compost isn't considered a fertilizer, so you can also apply that any time of year, whether you're in the ban or outside of the ban. So you do have a few options for different types of fertilizers if you're in the ban period. We also have a couple apps you can use, um, A, to locate your specific county, or you can look up your zip code or your address to find out which ordinance applies to you. Um, if you search Florida fertilizer ordinances on the internet, um, it usually is the first link. You just select that link and it'll bring you to a web page. And on that web page, it just says, go to the app and it'll open right up, kind of like a map of Florida where it'll show each county and each ordinance and city. Um, if you know where you live, you can just click that spot, or if not, you can search it up through your address. Um, with me, I have it on my phone. I just opened up that web page and I kind of saved it to my home screen. That way, if I ever need to answer any questions or if I'm curious about any other ordinances in other counties, it's a really good resource. Um, and then there's also some other um, different apps and websites you can use to help you identify different plants, toxic plants. Um, butterfly gardens, pollinator plants, and things like that. So a lot of different resources out there um, for you. So we have all this talk about the ordinances, but we kind of want to wonder why we have the ordinances to begin with. So one of the main things that the ordinance does as well as restricting what you can use is where you can use it. So the ordinance states that no fertilizer may be applied within 10 feet of water bodies. That's just because if you apply the fertilizer too close to the edge of a water body, it's more likely to enter that water body and have harmful negative effects on it. It's also recommended to have a six foot no-mo zone to protect the waterfront. That just means around the perimeter of your pond. Typically, you'll have six to 10 feet, just depending on what kind of room you're working with or what the residents are okay with and what they choose. And it's just a place where you won't mow. You um, sometimes can plant some low-lying vegetation around the edge. Um, you just kind of leave it to itself. You don't have to let it grow until it's, you know, a couple of feet high. You can keep it maintained at, you know, a foot or two height. Um, but you'll just want to have kind of like a buffer that way that fertilizer that is applied 10 feet and further. If it does rain, that fertilizer starts coming towards your water body and your pond. That no mow zone, the grass will kind of absorb a lot of the nutrients and prevent them from making their way into the water body. And why we focus on nitrogen and phosphorus is because both of these contribute to water pollution and algae growth. Um, a lot of stormwater ponds, ponds, lakes that you'll see, um, a lot of them at times will have a lot of algae covering the top, which a little bit of algae is good, but an excess of algae can have a lot of negative effects on the pond and the environment inside the pond and outside the pond. So when you have an excess of nutrients, 
um, you have these algae blooms. You get a lot of algae. It'll cover up at times the entire top of your pond. When it covers up the top of your pond, it prevents sunlight from reaching the good submerged vegetation in the pond. Um, and what this does is when that submerged vegetation isn't getting the good nutrient or the sunlight that it needs, it will die. And as it dies and decomposes, it will absorb a lot of the dissolved oxygen in the pond. This dissolved oxygen is required for the fish. So as a result of the decomposing submerged vegetation taking the dissolved oxygen, the fish won't get it and you can have really big fish kills. You'll start seeing some dead fish floating at the top of your pond and that's usually a sign of excess nutrients. Um, it can also reduce your water clarity and quality. Um, obviously, if you look out at your pond and all you see is algae covering the top, it's not gonna look very nice. Um, it could even cause loss of recreation. If it's a pond, people like to kayak on, fish on, things like that. Um, a lot of times when you have excessive nutrients, you've got a lot of excessive aquatic weeds, which are usually invasive weeds. They don't have a natural predator. They're gonna, they can take over your pond. Um, I have a pond right now in my adopt a pond program, which I'll talk about in the next slide, that has what's called torpedo grass. Um, and we have aerial imagery that can track the pond over several years. And in a matter of six months, the pond, I think it got about 40% covered in the torpedo grass to the point to where they can't really use a good portion of the pond anymore for recreation or activities that they used to. So we can have um, a really big impact to the wildlife, to recreation, um, to things like that. So because of this, the county has an adopt a pond program. This is pretty much anywhere in unincorporated Hillsborough County. If you live on a stormwater pond that's dedicated drainage to the county, or it's got storm pipes connected to the county's easements, um, you and your community can actually adopt the pond. So what this means is you and your neighbors will adopt your pond. Um, you'll get with us at the county, submit an application. The county will come out, we'll do a pond walk with you. We'll walk around the pond, see what kind of invasive uh, vegetation you're dealing with. Um, look at the algae growth in your pond, see if you have any good submerged vegetation. We'll pretty much get a good idea of the health of the pond. And from there, we'll put together a planting plan. This just means we get together with the residents and we offer them um, a pretty extensive list of plants they can select. Most of them that we have are flowering plants just because they look nice. They add some, um, they just make your, your pond look a bit nicer. Um, the county will provide these plants um, and the community comes together and the community will plant those plants around their pond based on the plan that we give them. Um, and then after the initial planting, we just keep in contact after a certain period of time, I believe it's six months, you can kind of tell which plants have taken, which ones haven't. The county can provide more plants if requested, different plants if some didn't work. Um, and it's just kind of like a, a back and forth, see it as you go situation. Um, the program does take three years. We just ask for the three year commitment because things obviously, unfortunately they don't happen overnight. It does take a lot of time. Um, so we ask for that three year commitment that way over those three years, we can work together change the plants, add more plants. Um, if the residents have any requests, um, we can go there. And even then, if your pond isn't eligible for the adopt a pond program, we are more than welcome to come out and walk your pond and offer um, some really good advice and resources um, and kind of lead you in the right direction. And then if you were curious about it, you can just search Hillsborough County adopt a pond and it'll lead you right to our website. Um, and you can either fill out the application and mail it, or you can fill it out online and email it to the uh, yeah, contact information on the page. And I think that's it for me. Do a lot of people use that program? The program had a really big turnout in the beginning. Um, there was a lot of change in um, the position and COVID happened, unfortunately. So it kind of fell to the back burner, but we're ramping it back up and we probably have 10 to 15 ponds right now that we're in talks with.
Like that is the difference I that forgot difference. to mention. That's right. Perfect. So yeah. city of Tampa does have a sales ban, which means retail locations are not allowed to sell it in that ban period, whereas Hillsborough County retail locations are still allowed to sell it. So sometimes people will leave city of Tampa, go to Hillsborough County unincorporated and they'll buy that fertilizer. Um, but if you are purchasing fertilizer in Hillsborough County during that ban, just make sure to pay attention to what you're buying because it'll still be on the shelves. You just can't use it. So. There. Great presentation. Thank you. Oh, uh, we do. Um, so at the very beginning, when we get your application, we have to get approval from Swift Mud and EPC to make sure it's not a jurisdictional wetland. If it's a wetland, it's not applicable or it's not allowed to be into the program. Mm -hmm. Habitat yeah. issue a lot in pond recently. You can see where wildlife has tried to spar and wire and run holes. And people in the community have tried to contact somebody, and you know, we feel like our, our concerns are falling on the deaf ears. Mm -hmm. you know, but is that something that you guys would look into? Or is that you can definitely talk. Yeah, definitely. Um, if you want, I'll be after. Okay. We can yeah. kind of talk about that. Yeah, lake issues could go to Sarah or the lake Swift Mud. Questions I can answer. Uh huh. She brought her business cards. Thank you so much, Sarah. So now we're going to get to the meat and potatoes, guys, how to fertilize plants. So now that you know all the rules, the regulations, um, we're going to talk about turf grass, landscape plants, palms, vegetables, and fruit trees. Um, I wanted to include house plants too, but I didn't get around to it. So maybe next time. Um, turf is very complicated to fertilize. All right. There's a lot of rules. We have these sayings twice is nice twice is nice that means one time in the spring think tax time fertilizer tax time fertilizer april 15th is a good time if you haven't fertilized your lawn yet and you feel like you need to you better do it now before the date of june 1st june 1st no more nitrogen that's the main thing that the turf grass needs make sure the fertilizer contains 50% slow release nitrogen. You got to read the back of the bag, all right? Or maybe you'll get lucky and it will say it on the front of the bag in big letters. Um, if you fertilize in the fall, you can't do it until after September 30th. So as long as we're not getting a hurricane, do it right at October 1st, because see these um, shoot growth of the grass here, um, we want to still get it when it's actively growing, you know, so the ban kind of prevents us from doing it in the summer, but with the slow release fertilizer, it lasts for say three months. So you do it in April or May, June, July, August, you just no fertilizer in September, and then you can go again in October. So um, April and October, May and October is fine too, but if we're still having a hurricane in October, wait until after the hurricane, because remember, no fertilizer before heavy rains, all right, so I'll get that right there, that's the zone. Are you choosing the right fertilizer? This is the complicated part. You're going to go to the store, and there's going to be all these different products, so to start boiling it down, First, if you're fertilizing turf grass, look for something with turf grass on the label, like fertilizer for turf, because this is usually going to have some nitrogen and some potassium, which is what the turf really needs. Um, the first number here, um, the 2904, that's not a good number for us because it's too high in nitrogen, 29% nitrogen. The zero is good because zero phosphorus and only 4% potassium, that's not enough. Remember, potassium is usually low, so we want more potassium. 
The second one, 18, 24, 12. What is wrong with that? Too much phosphorus. One, turf grass doesn't need that much phosphorus. Two, it's illegal to apply it without a soil test. So don't do that one. Number three um, is a good ideal, you know, turf grass. 16, zero, eight. It has nitrogen. It has no phosphorus. It has potassium. And then they will talk about the ratio, the two to one ratio of N to K. So twice as much nitrogen as potassium. It could be equal, like one to one. So if it was 16, zero, 16, or eight, zero, eight, that would be okay. But um, 16, zero, eight is, is my favorite kind um, off the record. But um, you could get something like 30, zero, 15. And that would still be that two to one ratio. That's just a stronger fertilizer. So instead of using a 33 pound bag, you might only use a 15 pound bag. So um, when you're looking at the label in this um, sunny land, nitro green is an excellent product made in Florida, manufactured in Stanford actually. It has that two to one ratio of N to K. No phosphorus, it says that very clearly on the front label. It does have at least 50% slow release nitrogen. They're making some with 65%, which some counties are bumping it up to 65% slow release. Um, it's still 50 here. And then the other thing is you're gonna buy this big bag of fertilizer. Ideally, you would apply it kind of like all at once to your lawn and your landscape beds. If you only have a very small lawn, this thing says it covers um, 7,600 square feet. Then you're gonna be left over with this fertilizer bag you gotta store in your garage for six months and hopefully it doesn't get wet or spill or you know anything like that. So another thing about turf grass, you know, no fertilizer during the blackout periods with nitrogen or phosphorus. If you're using a push fertilizer spreader, it's required by law to have a fertilizer shield, deflector shield is what it's called. And that way you can go right along the driveway and you're not fertilizing the driveway. Fertilizing driveways is a waste of fertilizer and can potentially harm the environment you know, when we get the rain. We don't wanna fertilize the sidewalk. Um, we don't wanna fertilize, you know, the water body. So use that deflector shield when you're 10 feet or more away from the water to make sure it doesn't go that way. There's also a rule about how much nitrogen you can apply at one time. No more than one pound of nitrogen per 1000 square feet per application. All right. so. You know, it, you gotta do some math here. And of course the slow release is required. But so here is a hypothetical yard. How do you calculate the square feet? Um, well, this simple math, you know, area of a square or a rectangle, the front yard, 20 feet um, long and 30 feet wide, 20 times 30, that's 600 square feet. You calculate the side yard too in the backyard and add that all together and then you'll get you know how much total area you want to cover and then um, like for a yard like this I would just kind of include the landscape beds because you can use that turf grass fertilizer on the landscape beds they like a similar analysis um, if you have a, a bigger yard or a smaller yard you might look for a bigger bag or a smaller bag of fertilizer and it's kind of easy to do this math in like little squares, like it, kind of calculating the area of a circle is very complicated, the pi 3.14 thing times. So just stick with like any kind of little square blocks you can get and that will help you. Um, so. so that bag would, that's only, you're saying that's only 600 square feet? 600 square feet, feet for the front yard. The bag says it covers 7,600 oh, square right. feet. Yeah, right. So maybe you and your neighbors can share or, or use it on your landscape beds too. Yeah. Uh-huh. So another thing, and this is getting deep into turf grass science, but different species of turf grass like different amounts of fertilizer. So bahia grass is very kind of low fertilizer needs, but St. Augustine grass is higher. So, um, you know, back to if you're applying 
one pound of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet per application. So then you want, you know, Bahia grass for central Florida is one to three pounds nitrogen per 1,000 square feet per year. So um, St. Augustine, which is kind of what a lot of people have, for example, if we're going with the low rate of two pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet per year, you would do the one at the tax time, April 15th, and then you would do the second one, October 1st. And there you go, your two pounds of nitrogen for the whole year. And, and if, you, if you're not trying to have the most immaculate yard in the neighborhood, the two pounds is fine. I mean, you can even get away with one pound or whatever. The more kind of higher maintenance, like Disney World probably is more up like the, the four to five pounds per, because they want that bling bling landscape, you know, but at the cost of the environment. So it's, that's kind of why the whole fertilizer ban is in place. We want, we choose water bodies over green lawns and everybody has that choice to make. Um, so let's move on to landscape plants. So landscape plants are part of the fertilizer ban, just like turf grass. Um, they like, you know, similar things to turf grass, nitrogen, potassium. They are kind of lower maintenance. Turf grass likes a lot of water and a lot of food. Landscape plants, it's good to get them established with the water and the food, but later on you can kind of back it off especially if you're adding some compost and mulch and like building the soil and making a, a more holistic ecosystem. So fertilizers are not always needed. If you have, you know, native drought tolerant things that look green and they look fine, you might skip the fertilizer on them. But, um, you know, just pay attention, like palm trees, look for those lower leaves turning yellow, look at the leaves for nutrient deficiencies. If you have something in particular, you know, that you just want to fertilize this one shrub, you can do a little sprinkle around kind of like the drip line of that shrub or tree or plant. Um, or you can kind of broadcast it over the whole area like this one, I would maybe just use more of a broadcast type of thing. Um, so yeah, building the soil, you know, the leaf it be, rake your leaves into the landscape beds. If you don't like the look of that, buy a couple bags of mulch to cover it up so your neighbors don't complain. And then I just had to put this plug in here for native plants because they're adapted to the local soil, like cabbage palms, the native palm, they don't get all these bad nutrient deficiencies like the ones from Africa and Asia do. So, um, you know, you can incorporate some flowers or these kind of bulletproof landscape plants like the cabbage palms, the kunti, the mully grass, and basically rarely or ever like fertilize them. You know, they're very drought tolerant and adapted to our Florida soils. So like this picture on the left, you might recognize that from the um, Tampa River Walk. So like our government is using these strategies in their landscape. They are purposely planting these resilient landscapes because it's right next to the Hillsborough River. They don't wanna be fertilizing there and polluting the river. Um, that would be within at least six or 10 feet of the river too, so. Yeah, so, um, you know, you can choose some of those for your landscape. So let's um, switch gears now and talk about palm trees. So once you start to get, get for an eye for this, when you're driving home today, you're going to be looking for these um, date palms and be like, oh, that one's deficient. That one has a nutrient deficiency. And then you can write letters and leave it on like people's cars and be like, hey, <laughs> in case you didn't know, your palm is starving to death. All right, please give it some potassium and magnesium because the, the palm is clearly hungry. You can see this from 100 feet away. Now, palms like, they're kind of the opposite of turf. They like, a, say, like an 8 to 12, so higher potassium than nitrogen. Um, technically, we're not supposed to apply any phosphorus to this, but um, the science and the fertilizer ban versus the commercial fertilizer market, we don't all play well together. Um, I couldn't find a bag of palm fertilizer with a zero phosphorus when I went to the store. So I did get a 1% phosphorus, don't tell anybody. Um, 
so the rate is like if you have this analysis the eight percent nitrogen and stuff one and a half pounds so that's like a about uh two cups of fertilizer per 100 square feet of palm canopy area that's uh 10 by 10 100 square feet so you have a nice big palm it's probably maybe 100 square feet so maybe about two cups of palm fertilizer with a similar analysis. Now, if your analysis was 16% nitrogen, you would only use um, 0.75 pounds because it's a stronger fertilizer, so you would use less. All right, so um, palms are special because they respond to fertilizer very slowly. So you're almost doing like preventative nutrition. They like maybe a quarterly, um, you know, a little doctoring up every quarter. And if you're using slow release, um, then those usually last for three months. So, you know, at least fertilize twice a year for the non-native kind, especially if you see this yellowing, then bump it up uh, to maybe four times a year. The phosphorus, I mean, the um, potassium will help green it up like those lower leaves. Um, but remember, we have to um, pay attention to the fertilizer ordinance. So in the blackout period, no nitrogen, no phosphorus, only potassium. And so some manufacturers are starting to make like a 0, 0, 12. Um, and the four here is the magnesium for the blackout period for palm trees. Another thing about palms is don't over prune them because they actually use those nutrients in the lower palm fronds to feed the upper ones. So kind of the rule of thumb here is if the leaf is like 50% or more dead or totally brown, cut it off. But otherwise, leave at least um, on the hands of the clock, you know, 9 p.m. until 3 a.m. Leave that canopy. Don't do the hurricane mohawk cut. That's bad for palms. All right, because all the palm fronds, those are providing all the nutrients and they're helping the photosynthesize. So stripping your palms of leaves is not a good idea. It's going to end up in disease and insect problems because uh, um, those palms recycle the lower leaves. It's actually some more hurricane proof with more, more leaves on them. So cut off the dead leaves, but the living leaves, um, leave them be. And like I talked about the native plants, the native palms are more well-suited for Florida. So like cabbage palm, the sable palm, saw palmetto, um, Everglades palm. That's, those are just three that grow in our area, for example. So next we're gonna talk about vegetable gardens. Is anybody here doing vegetable gardens? All right, so vegetable gardens are exempt from most fertilizer ordinance. I haven't read all hundred and whatever of them. So they are exempt from both of the ones in our area, Tampa, city of Tampa and Hillsborough County. And um, most vegetable fertilizers, like if you look on the bag, um, you wanna kind of choose something specific for vegetables and it will be more of a balanced fertilizer, like a 666 or like a 434 or something like that. Um, it doesn't have that requirement for slow release because some vegetable crops only uh, live for 30 or 60 days. So you don't want to plant a radish and fertilize it and then be having that slow release for the next two months. Um, but maybe you have other stuff in your garden. So it doesn't matter if it's organic or, or not organic in the sense that the nutrients you know, go to the plant and the plant doesn't really care. Where organic fertilizers are preferred by some is that they, one, they don't add excess salts to your landscape, and two, they help to build the soil. All of the organic products are made from some maybe stinky, you know, previous living um, thing. It could be like cottonseed meal, it could be like fish meal or crab meal or feather meal or blood meal or bone meal or a mixture of, you know, dead plants and animals all ground up into organic fertilizers. And, you know, that's kind of how we did it back in the day too. We use like cow manure, horse manure, you know, um, when animals died, we'd bury them and compost them and, you know, fertilize with them. But now that we have, you know, modern technology and we can just poof, make fertilizer out of, 
thin air using the Haber-Bosch process, um, you know, we can get this, you know, like miracle grow shake and feed, you know, that's a nice granular, doesn't stink at all. But the benefit of choosing organic is it does feed the soil and the soil microorganisms, which we talked about. But whichever one you want to use, always follow the fertilizer best management practices. So no fertilizing before heavy rains, read the label, use the correct rate. Um, and it's not a mandatory, but you know, when you fertilize, you can cover the fertilizer, even when you're doing your turf, I didn't mention, but turn your irrigation system on just real quick, maybe a quarter inch or something to make all those little fertilizer granules fall off of the leaves onto the ground. Or if you ever get it on the leaves, you know, just brush the leaves. That way the fertilizer can fall down and maybe kind of like um, incorporate it into the soil a little bit. So um, here is a picture of a little seminal pumpkin that I grew and I, you know, started it in the little pot, planted it in the bigger one. And then after it really started to leaf out, boom, that's when I give it fertilizer. And then, then it really takes off. But how it's on the surface there, I would just add a little extra compost or incorporate it a little bit. And then that will prevent nitrogen from poof going up in the air through that volatilization process. Did you have a question? I'm sorry, also organic versus inorganic fertilizer. Yeah. Um, besides the salt, the extra salt that's in the inorganic, if you have a decent amount of fertilizer in your bed, does applying a little bit of inorganic actually hurt the soil water? Oh, good. So the question is if we have organic versus inorganic. Um, you know, if you use mostly organic or you compost and have leaves, that's good for the soil. If you use a little bit of inorganic, then that's okay too. Like a little bit of salt isn't going to hurt. Um, but um, it's kind of the, the best, maybe we call sustainable agriculture is a combination of both. So you build the soil with all the organic, always organic, but then you want to get a big fat tomato hit it with a little synthetic. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're only using synthetic or inorganic fertilizer over time, there can be salt buildup, which can lead to high pH and burning of plants and stuff. So, but yeah, a little bit of each is fine. And that's how um, commercial farmers do it too. So like the timing of fertilizer, you know, you might put a little bit of pre-plant fertilizer in for the vegetables to get them started, especially that phosphorus for the root development and initiation. But then when it starts to fruit, like you see your tomato flowering and fruiting, flowering, apply fertilizer, fruiting, apply fertilizer. Same thing with fruit, like fruit trees. So if you want to get really technical and you want to be a commercial farmer, there are specific rates of, say, nitrogen for all these different crops, like tomatoes, peppers, they're kind of heavy feeders. They would want 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre, um, whereas something like a bean, um, pole beans, lima beans, they're fine with 100 pounds of uh, nitrogen per acre. They're also nitrogen fixers because they're legumes. They're in the legume family. So you can look up this very detailed information in this 50 page vegetable production guide handbook. All right. And, but for regular homeowners gardening for dummies, we have general rates. And so we're assuming at the home scale level, you're not growing the 10 foot corn that's going to get an eight foot um, an eight inch um, corn plant on it. Instead, we kind of go for a general rate of 80 pounds of nitrogen per acre, assuming you have mixed vegetables. So you're growing a row of green beans and you got a couple broccolis and carrots. And so uh, nobody's doing a home vegetable garden on an acre. So here you got to do some math. So that boils down to two pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet. 1,000 square feet is still very big. If you have one vegetable garden that's four feet by eight feet, how many square feet is that? 32. Okay, that's a lot less than 1,000. 
So here I'm just giving you an example. If you only have 100 square feet, which is kind of about the size of the garden pictured here, and you don't want to fertilize like in the middle of the row where the mulch is, um, you would use about five pounds. So you know how they sell it in the little five pound bag. Um, five pounds of a fertilizer with an analysis of 4% nitrogen, 434, um, to 100 square feet. Okay, now if your fertilizer is stronger, like 8% nitrogen, if you have a 10, 10, 10, you're going to use maybe two and a half pounds or something. You know, the stronger it is, the less you use. So that's kind of the benefit of some of the organic ones. They're not very strong, so you can just put a lot of fertilizer out and to fertilize your plants. So again, you can till it in to your soil before planting, or you can do some of that. And then once the plants flower and fruit, give them a little side dress or top dress um, later on, especially with long lived crops, like corn is like a 90 day crop. So you just can't put it all in at the beginning, you know, maybe even three doses or something. So um, next I'm gonna talk about fruit tree fertilization. So fruit trees are special, kind of like palms are special, and they like regular food, especially citrus nowadays, you know, spoon feed it a couple times a year, maybe two or three or more times a year. And again, they like high potassium and that's for the fruiting part. Um, so here's a fertilizer analysis of uh, 839. So it has some nitrogen, a little higher in potassium, and also a little bit of phosphorus. Now, if you're trying to make fruits, don't use too high of nitrogen because nitrogen drives leaf growth. And then on the fruit tree, just like the palm tree, fertilize down to the drip line and all around in the diagram here, it says don't fertilize right next to the trunk. Like the trees just don't have a lot of roots right, right next to the trunk, but most of their feeder roots are kind of growing around the drip line. So fertilize that area in, inside. Um, and then it would probably be better if there wasn't grass like under this tree. So bare soil um, for citrus, mulch for other fruit trees is fine. And then um, fruit trees have really special needs that they recommend usually a foliar spray for some of these micronutrients like boron, copper, zinc, manganese, or even a soil drench with like a chelated iron product because iron doesn't really go in the leaves that much. Um, so around the roots, a soil drench, just like a bucket of water that has some iron in that you dump around. Um, also proper watering is important. You don't want your peach tree to be in a drought and make juicy fruits. You wanna be watering it, especially during those fruit times. So I have just a couple examples here. So ex if, for example, if you're growing bananas, um, here's the recommended fertilizer, a 6 to 12 Everybody knows bananas are high in potassium. So they need a lot of potassium fertilizer. So that 12% potassium, it twice as much potassium as nitrogen. And then they like that little nutritional spray of um, manganese and zinc, maybe once a year, um, maybe copper if you're not using any copper fungicides. And we have UF IFAS, bananas in the home landscape, like publications on every different type of fruit, bananas, papayas, avocados, mangoes. So you kind of have to look these up like one by one. So peaches and nectarines. All right. This likes more nitrogen. It's a 12 for eight in year one, when you're just planting the tree, you know, start with a quarter cup. And then in late May, maybe a half a cup to get it through the summer, um, July, more. And then the next year, you know, keep bumping it up as the tree goes and grows. If you look in these publications, you'll get these very um, detailed tables of how much fertilizer do these fruit trees need. Avocado is similar to mango, whereas, you know, every, they get to be a big tree. So every year you're beefing it up. Look at the total amount per tree per year in pounds. And they're saying to use like a 666 or an 839 or similar fertilizer material. So sometimes the numbers don't exactly matter, but you wanna be feeding it frequently. 
but you know, year one, you're using maybe up to three pounds, whereas by the time you got to year five, you're using maybe up to 14 pounds. So 14 pounds, that's a, a decent sized bag of fertilizer. And what, by the time the tree is um, eight or more years, you're putting 20 pounds of fertilizer, like that's a whole bag, but multiple times a year, it says four times a year. So 20 divided by four, that'd be one little five pound bag each time that you do it. So we can get real technical here, but I think you guys have had enough for today. We're already running late. And so here's a couple resources for you. Um, the fertilizer ordinance um, for the Zoom people, we're gonna send you the ordinance in the mail. And of course our gardening solutions website is your first go-to spot. You wanna know about mangoes or vegetables and that we'll have all the links to the other Edis pubs. And then like Sarah mentioned for the GIBMP, if you wanna see if your landscape contractor has taken the training or if you wanna take the training, then you can go to this GIBMP website. And so I'll email you guys these links and we did record the talk for today. So I'd like you to um, thank you very much for coming and please fill out our survey. You will be required to turn that in before leaving the room. And um, we'll take yeah. any questions now. Question. Clay? Yeah, that will increase the CEC because clay holds nutrients better than sand does. Okay, and that, that explains why up north, oh, yeah. a lot of times it so you could add clay. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, if you have any extra, you can bring some to my garden. Yeah, no, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't clay, it is. Clay. I know. You know, okay, so that's mm -hmm. true Yeah, yeah, it's not like super sustainable, like what, we are all going to import a bunch of clay, but you know, if you have some, yeah, question in the back. What was her question? Oh, her question was, if you have clay, would that be beneficial to add to the soil? And I said, yes, it would be if you can for rose or anything really. Someone had told me it was for knockout roses, mm -hmm. but they added clay to it for Florida soil and their roses are like fantastic. They never have problems with them, but it's hard to find good clay. Take a truck up to Georgia. <laughs> yeah, any other questions? What about adding compost to the lawn? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, uh huh. The top dressing with compost, like a little sprinkle, sprinkle, is good for the lawn. Fertilizer spreader. Uh, I don't think you can put compost in a fertilizer spreader. I mean, they might have commercial ones to do that. Yeah, uh, question? Um, how much nitrogen do you get from rain? Oh, how much nitrogen do you get from rain? You do get some nitrogen from rain. Um, I'm not sure exactly the quantity, but um, it, it is measurable, you know. I didn't mention reclaimed water, but if anybody's on reclaimed water, that has a lot of nutrients and salts in it, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming and I'll be around to answer any other questions. You like my jokes, honey? You got any new ones for me? Well, that's enough for today. Well, we're over time. I'd like to be up here for longer. Okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's 11 or 7. Yeah. Epsom salts for palm tree. Do you recommend that? Mm -hmm. Epsom salts are good. If you look a lot of, I know a lot of people that always say use Epsom salts, and I try to use them, tell them sometimes to get a um, 
fertilizer. They have a lot of magnesium, yeah. which is what so Sometimes it's like one of my friends was putting it on, and I came over to his place one day, and it looked like they dumped the whole salt bag all over, and I go like, it looks like you put a lot on. I just didn't know what you thought. Tomatoes, too. What? Tomatoes, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just didn't know what you thought about that. All right. Thank you for waiting for us. Oh,